Okay, we're live. Okay. I'd like to welcome Dr. Grant Syverson to the show today. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> Good. So how long have you been a pediatric rheumatologist? Uh, I graduated from fellowship in 2011, so nine years now. So wow. I did my, yeah. So how did you get into becoming a pediatric rheumatologist? I was fortunate during my uh, fourth year of uh, medical school to do a rotation with uh, an orthopedics group up in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And I worked with an adult rheumatologist when I was there, Dr. Lassard. And I wasn't really thinking about rheumatology prior to residency, but I really saw at the time, that was about the time some of the newer biologics were coming out. And you could really see um, an impact that the newer therapies were having on his patients, even patients that have had adult RA for a long time. And it was cool to hear their stories. And, you know, it was really something to, you know, see their exams. And it was something that really intrigued me. And then when I got to um, my residency program in Milwaukee, the program director at that, that time, at that time, his name is Jane Ockton. He's a peds rheumatologist. And I uh, had expressed an interest I mean, I took an elective my first year of residency uh, and really, really enjoyed it. It was a four week elective, primarily outpatient, but I found that, you know, the, the clinical aspects where you get to know families and, um, you know, can really make an impact in changing and treating their diseases. And also, um, you know, just seeing the attitudes of the people I worked with, having good mentors really reinforced that to me. And then I uh, decided about my second year of residency that I wanted to go to fellowship. And I was able to stay in Milwaukee for that too. And so I did another three year fellowship then at that time. And it's been a really, I've really been really happy with my career choice. I certainly um, love my job. And I feel lucky in that sense that I, I enjoy coming to work every day and I enjoy the patients I get to see. And, you know, and I really enjoy how well we can treat patients nowadays and how positive the outcomes are. Because I know hearing stories from some of my mentors, you know, prior to, you know, in the 80s and 70s and things like that, just, you know, outcomes were not good and it was a tough time. And, you know, it's really, it's really exciting to be involved in a field that has so many uh, clinical advances and also just the ability to understand why our diseases occur um, has really advanced a ton in the last decade. So, Yeah, so I'm sure, as you know, there is a shortage of pediatric rheumatologists within our country. And I was wondering, why do you think that is? I think one is there, you know, sometimes when there's a shortage, people don't get any introduction to it during medical school or residency. And so I certainly, you know, like I mentioned, didn't really think about rheumatology at all until I had been with someone and practiced with them. And especially if you don't have pediatric rheumatology, you know, most, as, as many patients with arthritis know that are kids, you know, you tell someone you have arthritis and they have a hard time believing it. And that even happens within medicine. You know, I have, people I've introduced myself to and said what I do for a living. And they're like, Oh, are you busy? And I'm like, yeah, you know, it kind of depends where you are, but um, the awareness of those conditions, you know, people don't think about them if they don't see them. Um, and, you know, so I, I feel really lucky that I can expose medical students and residents to that. Now um, it's also a field in rheumatology that, you know, when you're learning about it in medical school clinically or just seeing it in the book, it can, it can sound really, you know, scary because, you know, you see, you hear about things like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus and, you know, your pathology textbooks has a lot of the negative outcomes. Um, it doesn't really have, you know, what, what positive things can occur with proper management. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a field that, um, you know, people talk about, you know, different types. It's, it's, it's not an action field, so to speak. When I, you know, what I mean by that is it's not, you're not in the ER. You certainly have emergencies um, and you're not often in the ICU, which is fine with me, but, you know, some people really gravitate towards those more 
uh, you know, really, really sick patients. And we do get sick patients, but, you know, thankfully, um, it's primarily an outpatient specialty. And you know, so there's a myriad of reasons why, you know, I think for PEDS residents, um, once they get exposed to it, most people really like it. And they, they really understand how much you use your physical exam compared to other forms of medicine. Uh, and I know when I was in Madison, we don't have a PEDS residency in Fargo yet, but someday we will. But in Sioux Falls, I've worked with residents and that's been good. Also the Arthritis Foundation and the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Rheumatology, which are kind of our um, you know, groups that coordinate our uh, meetings and things like that have really improved um, the access to meetings and other types of things that residents can go to. And so getting that exposure early in training, I think is gonna be most key to get people interested. Yeah, so what would you say to encourage someone in the medical field to go into pediatric rheumatology? Well, I try to really, you know, talk about my passion for the work. Um, I talk about, you know, the ability to use your physical examination skills and not, you don't have to rely so much upon, you know, tests and images and you certainly do those, but um, it's really an older school type of medicine in that sense. But I also kind of just talk about the relationships you can build with families. And, you know, I try to just reinforce that, you know, how fun it is to work with kids. I mean, that's for me, one of the highlights too, is I just look, work, like working with kids, no matter what age. Newborns kind of scare me, uh, which I don't see a ton of those, but um, certainly uh, I try to reinforce how interesting the conditions are. I talk about the importance of the physical exam and I really try to talk about, you know, the positive outcomes nowadays. And that, that really helps people. Yeah. So would you like to explain what arthritis is since you're kind of a professional in this? Yeah. So the way I think about arthritis, when I talk to patients or I talk to families and, you know, learners is arthritis itself, anything that ends in ITIS is the first thing I say means inflammation. So arth means joint. Itis means inflammation, so joint inflammation. And I talk about, for patients, you know, I also speak about what, you know, the immune system does. And so the immune system normally, uh, and we're all learning about the immune system now with coronavirus and how it works and doesn't work. And so the normally our immune system is supposed to help us, protect us from getting sick over and over again. Doesn't keep us from getting sick at all. Um, but in patients that have juvenile arthritis, uh, we have an overactive immune system and where it starts to see the joints as, you know, I think about it like foreign invaders. And a simplistic way to think about it for kids is it's kind of like getting a cold in your joint. So you, we know when you get a cold, you know, you can get inflammation and people can see that with runny nose or sore throat, but it's kind of like doing that in your joint. You can't see it as much except with swelling, but it's an overactive inflammation that targets the joints. And the importance of understanding the immune function also kind of allows me to explain to uh, patients and learners, you know, how we go about treating it. And so we take things like naproxen or ibuprofen or meloxicam, our anti-inflammatories. So they don't suppress the immune system, but they suppress the amount of inflammation we can create. And then we also use things like steroids, injections, you know, methotrexate, everybody's favorite medication. No, not really, but, um, or the, you know, Humira, Enbrel, Actemra, medications that really focus on how our immune system creates inflammation. And so they targets the inflammatory molecules in our body and makes those less active, which results in decreased joint inflammation too. So long story short, I talk about it as inflammation within the joints of our body um, sometimes, you know, we have to get really basic and talk about what joints are, you know, the union between two uh, bones. Um, and, you know, that's kind of the, my basic way of explaining it. Yeah. So you talked about some of the treatments that there are for the arthritis. What would you recommend patients do on top of the treatments to stay on top of arthritis? Well, I think one of the biggest things I talk about with families is staying physically active. 
And because I think a lot of people worry that activity, because uh, it hurts some patients when they use their joints and that's pretty common, um, but they worry that, that that activity is gonna cause the joint inflammation to be worse. And certainly some activities can, but I, they worry that being more physically active is gonna make recovery harder when it's just the opposite. You know, Keeping active um, helps the stiffness get better but it also allows you to keep the muscles and ligaments healthy in the joint. Um, and that's why a lot of people do physical therapy once the inflammation is better. So staying physically active is important. Um, you know, kind of long-term outcomes that I talk about with families are, you know, because you have an inflammatory condition, you know, other things that people need to do to stay healthy, including having a healthy diet is important. You know, I get a lot of questions about what are anti-inflammatory foods, what are anti-inflammatory supplements. Um, the Arthritis Foundation has some good information about those. Um, my perspective is I always want to know what patients are taking. I'm not going to presume to know everything about supplements or things like that. But I think if we, I'm, I'm always open for patients to have other options. And, you know, if patients want to take something, as long as I know what it is, and I know that it's not going to impact, you know, other aspects of the, the therapy that we're doing, I'm usually keep, try to keep an open mind. So having a healthy diet is important. You know, if you're on medications that make you gain weight, like prednisone, you know, really, really focusing on um, making healthy diet choices are, are good. But we also know that the longer you have an inflammatory condition, you know, it can cause increased risks for heart disease, things like that as you get older. And so instilling healthy lifestyle habits um, early on is always have helpful and hopefully it can help the whole family. So what are the worst cases you have seen come into the space? Well, you know, looking at the different forms of arthritis, uh, systemic patients, systemic juvenile arthritis patients tend to have the most risk for negative outcomes, especially in the beginning, because they're coming in with a profound amount of inflammation. I've had two patients pass away that have had systemic arthritis. Uh, so obviously those are very, very negative outcomes. You know, it's exceedingly rare for kids with arthritis of all forms to have mortality or death. But the other severe cases I see are generally in patients that have had delays in diagnosis and come in with a lot of you know, chronic joint change that unfortunately in a lot, some cases is irreversible. And that's because once you get contractures or bone destruction, you know, a lot of those things are not gonna get better unless you can replace the joint. And there are certainly, you can replace your knee joint, you can replace your hip, you know, the older you are when you have to do that, the better. But there are joints like elbows, you know, finger joints that are really, there are not good replacement options. Um, so probably the most negative outcomes I've seen are kids that come in with some permanent disability. Um, and again, some of that does get better with treatment. And, you know, I've certainly seen kids that I thought, boy, they're going to have really a hard outcome and they've done remarkably well. Um, but probably the biggest most common negative outcome I see are kind of the chronic disability. Um, one thing I talk to families about, and one thing I know that Taylor and I were just talking about before the webinar started was camp, because I really am a big proponent of the arthritis camp. And this is not so much the case now, but I always used to talk to families about looking at the counselors when they went to camp and seeing a lot of the times older counselors were in that kind of pre, you know, modern therapy era and you saw, you could tell the difference between the counselors and the campers. You know, they had a lot more chronic changes. You know, there were kids in, you know, wheelchairs and things like that. And that does happen still, but not as frequent, thankfully. Um, but now when you go to camp and you have, you know, 18 to 20 year old counselors, you know, and even most of the campers, I mean, you would go to that camp and you would never know that the vast majority of those kids have arthritis because just because of how good of, of therapies that we have. Yeah. So on the flip side, how often do patients with arthritis get into remission? You know, it all depends upon the type of arthritis, uh, the age at, uh, at which they present. Um, and really, you know, there's a lot of research going into 
early aggressive treatment of arthritis. I think in the past, you know, we've been hesitant to be not necessarily not aggressive, but, you know, take our time and be, you know, judicious about therapy and realize that, but I think there's going to be more data coming out that the earlier you get kids into remission, the more likely they are to stay in that, in that, in that uh, state. Um, so, you know, the, the most common kids that we see with arthritis are little kiddos, you know, less than five that have what's called oligoarticular arthritis, so less than four joints involvement. And the vast majority of those patients do go into sustained long-term remission. Um, it's always hard at diagnosis to say what kids are gonna be that way. You know, there are some things that we look at as far as labs um, or joints involved that, you know, anecdotally we can say, you know, may put you at increased risk. Um, so I would say definitely more than 50% of those patients go into a sustained permanent remission. You know, the older you are when you get arthritis, uh, the less likely you are to go into a remission uh, in your teenage years. Um, and we do know that if you're rheumatoid factor positive or CCP antibody positive, and those are both uh, marker or autoimmune markers for, you know, classically adult rheumatoid arthritis, but if you have those markers be elevated, you know, your likelihood of going into sustained remission is not lower because we definitely have therapies that can get you there, but your likelihood of having a flare later on, if we're able to, you know, taper down therapy or things is higher. And again, you know, we don't know what early aggressive intervention, you know, the changes that'll happen. And that's, that's one thing that, uh, a lot of people are involved in something called the CARA registry. And some people in the call may recognize that, but CARA is our childhood arthritis research organization. And Sanford, where I work, we just started doing that within the last two months. And so we've been enrolling a lot of new patients in that. Patients that are at Mayo or University of Minnesota, they've been doing that for a longer period of time. But uh, since I'm fairly new in, in, in this part of the region of the country, we haven't had anybody do it yet. Um, but really the point of that registry is to get a large amount of data. And we have over 10,000 patients that are enrolled nationwide now, which is a huge number. But being able to take that information and follow those patients prospectively, which means into the future, and see what interventions, you know, what their common therapies, what common labs, what common you know, presentations look like as far as long-term outcomes. So I think that the information we're gonna have about long-term outcomes in, you know, in the next five to 10 years is gonna be significantly better than we've had over the last 30, 20, 30 years. Yeah. So before you started traveling down to South Dakota, South Dakota previously didn't have a pediatric rheumatologist. Yeah. So what made you decide to travel between these two states? Well, I knew when I, so I'm from North Dakota originally, um, and I knew that when I came back to North Dakota, you know, most, both North and South Dakota do not have huge populations. And, you know, I came from a city in Madison, which the metro area and the training in Milwaukee before that, both metro areas had more people than the whole state of North Dakota. Um, and so I knew when I came back that one, there'd been a, you know, a, a huge absence of care but also that uh, I would have the ability from a busyness standpoint where I could, go, I could do travel and outreach. Sanford is, you know, fortunately super good at allowing their practitioners to travel within um, each state to provide care. You know, I go to Bismarck as well, um, but there are people from Sanford, South Dakota that go to Rapid City, they go to Aberdeen, they go to Brookings. In North Dakota, we go to Minot, we go to Bemidji, we go to Thief River Falls. So, you know, regionally we have a really good presence, but they also make uh, the travel itself, you know, easy on the uh, expedition as much as possible, meaning they, they do a lot of flying, which is pretty unique around the country. And that honestly, if I didn't fly most of the time when I did outreach, you know, it would be really hard because if I had to drive everywhere I went, every single time. I mean, I'd be driving every week and that's a lot of time away from your family. But for me, I knew that patients in North and South Dakota have had to travel, you know, 
if they lived on the western side of the state, you know, they had to travel eight to 10 hours to get to Minneapolis or to Omaha, or um, some patients went to Kansas City, or even if you're in like Rapid City area, I have some patients that go to Denver, uh, which in the winter is not easy. Um, and in North Dakota, you know, you had patients driving from the Montana border all the way to Minneapolis every other week to get infusions. And, you know, I knew that if I was able to be in a, a place where I could at, offer care, you know, there would be patients that would, would utilize it, but also it, it just improves the quality of life for the family. And it's expensive to travel. It's expensive to travel, you know, when you're not going to see the doctor. And so much less when you're forced to see the doctor and it's not convenient, you know, it, it's really hard. And plus a lot of families are getting hotel rooms and, you know, they have to miss work, kids are missing school. And so anything we can do to make the impact of this disease smaller, you know, we all try to do that. So I got to ask then, what patients are better, South Dakota patients or North Dakota patients? <laughs> I love all my patients. So I, <laughs> I, I can't say one way or the other. You know, I, there's obviously a lot of similarities between the two states. Um, you know, so, so I would say, you know, my patients are probably the best compared to other pediatric rheumatologist patients. I'll just be judicious in that sense. I think my patients are the best. We'll just go to that. I guess that's a safe answer. <laughs> so like or you said- when I'm in Sioux Falls, the South Dakota patients are best. And when I'm in North Dakota, North Dakota patients, we'll say that. <laughs> so you stated before that you attended the Cam Cambria that I've been to before. Yeah. Do you think it's important that kids with juvenile arthritis would go to camps like these to find people that understand them? I think going to camp, I think being involved in some of the, the JA meetings that occur regionally and nationally. Um, I think being involved in, you know, the Arthritis Foundation has, you know, they're working on having more peer support groups. You know, anything that you can do that helps you understand that you're not alone as a patient is really important. And for families, it's very important because I would say the vast majority of my patients don't have anybody else in their school that has arthritis. And even if they do, they probably don't know who that person is. You know, one, I can't tell them because it's, you know, a, a privacy violation. You know, I certainly have patients tell me that if I learn of any other patient, you know, let them know or ask the other family if they'd be willing to meet with them. And that happens quite a bit. But I think it's as a patient that has a chronic disease, it's frustrating. And it's really frustrating if you have nobody to really share that with that understands. So like you alluded to, finding someone that knows how crummy it is to get a shot every week, some kids every day, or to be on medications that make you feel sick, or to not be able to do the activities that your friends can do, you know, that's really, really hard. And it's and what ends up happening is that patients get really frustrated and it, it makes outcomes worse because, you know, they don't want to be active. And, you know, having a chronic disease at baseline, you know, any chronic disease puts you at risk for, uh, you know, depression and anxiety. We know that. And so being able to have a way, an outlet to talk to someone who can understand what you're going through. And also to know you're not alone is, is incredibly helpful. And I've seen so many patients, you know, I, I think I have one patient out of all my patients that has gone to camp and didn't like it. Everybody, I have a lot of patients that are really nervous about camp and think it's going to be terrible. And once they go, though, they always want to go back. I mean, it, it's, it's, and it's really fun as, the, as a, an MD to go there and not necessarily have to, you know, just put on my MD hat every time and I can, you know, play uh, shaving cream with a ball or, you know, get pushed in the ball. pool. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's always really fun for the, and I know that my colleagues that are in the twin cities and in Rochester, you know, we all volunteer to do it. And, but it's, we all, it's easy for us to volunteer because it's just such a great time for all of everybody. So from the doctor's perspective, what do you think of camp? Like, are they doing it right for the patients with arthritis there? I think they do an amazing job. And I think the reason for that is it's driven from a, from a planning standpoint, you know, certainly healthcare providers are involved in that, but it's also driven a lot by 
patients that have their ex campers one, but also uh, parents of patients and patients themselves help drive a lot of the uh, activities. You know, I think camp should be fun, but I think it's also an opportunity that, you know, we do try to do t some teaching for kids to kind of understand the importance of healthy living, but also really to understand, you know, what are we asking them to do and why? Because I find that if patients have an understanding of why I'm having them take a medication, they tend to be less frustrated. They tend to, you know, be more willing to, to be open to things. And I don't ever want, you know, so I, I definitely feel like the way camp is set up now seems to be going really well. Um, I think from an MD perspective, most of us probably don't have a ton of time to do the planning with that, but thankfully the Arthritis Nation has some really invested um, folks in the, in, the, in the Minneapolis office and some in the North and South Dakota office, which work super, super hard to make it a good experience. So yeah, I think they're doing a great job. Okay. Now I just have one last question for you, and that is, why do you think it is important that we raise awareness for arthritis? Well, one, I, I, I alluded to it earlier, just by letting families know that uh, this is not something that is that rare. I mean, it's about one in 10,000 kids have arthritis, if not more. And, you know, if we talk about all rheumatic diseases, that number is higher. So it's important to raise awareness. So one, that um, parents and patients understand that they're not alone. But also the more awareness we have, um, the more interest we have in people going into it, but also uh, you know, the more research inf interest we get. And the more research we do in, in, these, in this field, not just on therapy, but also on genetics and outcomes and you know, you know, how we make medication, make medication easier to take, you know, the better everybody uh, will end up being. And it also really helps, you know, on some level for you know, schools and other organizations to understand that when kids come in and tell them they have arthritis, that it's a real thing. And that, you know, it, because that happens a lot too, where kids will come in and be like, oh, I tried to get out of gym class and my teacher didn't believe me, you know? And that's always, I always have to, I'll write a note, that's not a problem. But, you know, awareness itself really just makes um, the ability for patients to live a normal life easier. Okay, well, thank you for doing this again. Thanks, Taylor, it was, it was fun. <laughs> okay, once. All right.